Now on Granada, lights, camera, action. In films, nothing is ever quite what it seems. In fact, almost everything you see on the screen is some kind of trick. This ribbon of dreams, as Orson Welles put it, starts as an idea on a piece of paper, a strip of celluloid, and an empty studio. And then the production team goes to work. Watch this. Can we have a little background, please? A little foreground? All we need now is some action. Yes, looked dangerous, but happily not as dangerous as it seems because all that was down to the miracle of visual effects. That's a cut, print it. The story of visual effects is the story of a bunch of maverick directors and backroom boffins who soon realized how the cinema could fool us. And they've been doing it ever since, turning day into night, sun into rain, mice into men, and men into monsters. At its heart, every film has always been just the grand illusion. <laughs> Part of the fun that I have as a filmmaker is, is being a not only a storyteller, but also an illusionist, because I think that that's a lot of the spectacle of the cinema. Forrest Gump was the hit film of 1994, and one of the most successful movies of all time. It's also a goldmine of visual effects. This year's Oscar-winning director, Robert Zemeckis, is the latest in cinema's 100-year-old tradition to use tricks to fool us. Tell us a little bit about the war, man. Only he had a computer to recreate the world of Forrest Gump. The clever part is, most of the time you can't tell what's fake and what's real. In the uh, Washington reflecting pool rally scene, he used about 2,000 people in reality and, and kept moving them around the reflecting pool. And then just every time we moved them around, we shot a section of footage and then all these elements of film were combined in the computer and it was seamlessly put together to make it look like 200,000 people were actually there, all acting and performing on cue. Hey! <laughs> it was the happiest moment of my life. The newest criticism I'm hearing is that the images that we create in the computer are not real images. And I'm wondering, what is a real image? Filmmakers have been shooting people against fake backgrounds for years, from expensive locations painted on glass to back-projected scenes that make heroes of nervous actors. That was a very good one. This blue screen process is only the computer's way of performing the same trick. It's all fake, it's all illusion, it's all technical. It, none of it exists in any type of reality. So, to me, the digital image is just the extension of the lens. Very good, sir. Congratulations. How does it feel to be an All-American? Very good, sir. Congratulations. How do you feel? I got to pay. <laughs> I believe he said he had to go pee. At some point, the only restriction is going to be the imagination of the filmmaker, because you'll be able to actually create, realistically, any image that you can think of. Thirty years ago, director David Lean didn't have computers. What he had was a gang of shameless con men who had us believing that sunny Spain was snowbound Russia. What they did is they snowed up with artificial snow. They brought huge quantities of marble dust and salt, I don't know what, and spread the whole place, horizon to horizon, with it. 
That was it. And then and that was easy. At least it wasn't so cold. It was nice. I like shooting in artificial snow. It's nice. The inspiration for the interiors came from a photograph of Scott's ill-fated Antarctic expedition. It was a hut, there was a hole in the corner, and the wind had blown the ice and the snow over a period of time into that room. And it was coated in this extraordinary ice effect. I said, let's assume this has happened. And how do you do it? In the end, it was Eddie Fowley, the prop man. He went round with buckets of candle wax, white, melted. And he'd sling it over everything. And I followed him with ice-cold water and a syringe. When I thought it was right, I hit it with the water, and it froze. I shouldn't be telling people these things. They'll believe anything they see on the screen. But then the white marble dust went on. It's rather like kids doing their Christmas card. You know, somebody gives them a lot of glitter, and they put some glue on the shape of a star, and they throw it on, and it sticks, and the rest falls over. We never solved the problem of breath. Couldn't we try and we tried, but how do you in the middle of a Spanish summer get people to breathe out, that sort of stuff? All the windows were frosted over. We sprayed some of them with Epsom salts. Other ones that you had to do close-ups on, we took the glass pane out and put it in an ice box and froze it so it was covered with ice. And remember that particular scene where Omar Sharif goes to the window and rubs the ice away. Well then, for that, that was real ice. And I had a, a hair blower. As he rubbed, I was blowing this hot air onto the part where he was, was rubbing it to uh, melt the ice. You see uh, these daffodils which we had just planted the day before. That same house had scenes when it was spring and, and uh, autumn and summer. So they said, OK, next week we shoot spring, make it spring. So it was all iced up and then they had to make it, they have a week to make it spring, like trees and this. And when they made it autumn, they had all these people on ladders in the trees painting the leaves, you see, making them autumn colours. Another film masterpiece, Citizen Kane, was equally full of tricks, mostly pioneering zoom shots. But it was trickery after the event, not during it. Wells's arrogance and cheerful ignorance of how these things should be done protected him from the outraged voices of experience. I would say there was never a picture made I don't think in the history of the movie business that had more alterations and changes done in post-production than Citizen Kane. When Wells made the picture, he just asked for anything to be done in post-production. Some things utterly ridiculous. Rosebud. The ball that was in his hand when he found him dead. In post-production, he said, gee, I want to be inside that ball. Well, my gosh, that would big distance change there. So I said, well, it, it, it won't look good because I'll have to make one optical zoom on top of the other. He'd say, well, let's double expose some more snow in that ball. And I went in the stock library, put some snow in there, and lo and behold, that smoothed out the grain and the lack of resolution. Now we were outside of it, and the snow was spread all over the frame. And I said, oh, I've got to go back and mat all that snow out. He's, no, no, leave it in there. Well, there's nothing more ridiculous than the fact that that snow is covering the whole frame after you've pulled back outside of the ball. But there it is. These are things that the man uh, liked. Working with, uh, on that picture was, was, uh, was quite an uh, exciting, stimulating thing because it was never very much on an even keel, you know. At uh, one moment, he could be guilty of such an outrageous piece of behavior, you want to tell him to shove it and walk off, and before he could do it, he'd have an idea that was so brilliant to have your mouth gaping open. So it was always, always like that. Orson Welles was audacious until the end. The final shot, perhaps the most important in the film, is actually running backwards. The pioneer filmmakers soon realized how effectively the camera can lie. 
But it was the Hollywood of the 20s and 30s that turned the art of visual effects into an industry. In the studio system, technicians were prepared to have a go at anything. Lighting, costumes, models were all used to create illusion, and they quickly discovered that makeup was one of the best ways to conjure up a realistic monster. The greatest exponent of the grotesque was Lon Chaney. The man of a thousand faces could turn himself into Quasimodo and still leave 999 characters to go. Today's makeup artists acknowledge his influence. Chaney did some great makeups. He did a lot of actually pulling his anatomy around. And there's a great makeup, one of my favorites, he did for a film called London After Midnight, which is a lost film where he played this vampire character and he made this set of dentures that he wore that actually had these little hooks that held his mouth and this weird smiley face, you know. And he, he put these rings around his eyes to pull his eyes, eyelids down and make his eyes big and round. And he did a lot of very torturous kind of things, but the artistry was there. Cheney Sr.'s Phantom of the Opera has you know, one of the classic moments in, in you know, horror film the unmasking scene where, where she, she comes up behind him and rips this mask off and you see this horrifying face of Chaney. It was like one of the first times you saw that makeup. And I always wish that I could be you know, transported back to that time, you know, and to be sitting in a movie theater and never having seen anything like that before to see what that was like. That scene alone, I think, inspired me to, you know, to spend a lot of time making faces in the mirror, you know? So I was always, you know, standing, sitting in front of my, I had a little makeup mirror I put in my bedroom with little lights around it, similar to this, you know? And, and uh, I would stand in front of the mirror and go, ah, you know, make all these faces all the time, you know, and do all these different things, you know? And then I would, you know, paint my face up and put teeth in, you know, put these big set of teeth in my mouth and, and try, try just doing all these faces. So I actually got good at, I'm, I usually will do test makeups on myself because uh, I, I really feel it's important for, for a makeup artist to know what he's putting somebody through. The Frankenstein is, is probably the one that influenced me more than anything, the 31 version with Boris Karloff. Frankenstein's monster, for example, was fabricated on, on Karloff's face. The brow was built up by gluing uh, cotton onto his face and then painting this material called collodion. Take care there, Frankenstein. Take care. It's like a liquid plastic material. It's pretty horrible stuff to have painted, especially around your eye. So, I mean, it took, you know, from like six to eight hours to build up his brow and his forehead and to attach the electrodes and do all this and paint him up like that. Go and sit down. It's one of the great performances in the history of the cinema. With all that on, you know, and the rigidity of it all and the clothes he had to wear, everything to make him look bigger. I mean, he wasn't short, he was six feet tall, but he was made to look gigantic, of course. And moving around in those huge, heavy asphalt layers, boots. I did say one day, you know, playing these parts, is not easy, is it? And he just looked at me and said, you know, he said, I shall always remember what Lon Chaney said to me. That's the Lon Chaney, the father, the master. He said, if you can play a part other actors can't play or won't play because they don't have either the ability or the imagination or the nerve, if you can do that and you make your mark with it, you will never, ever be forgotten. <laughs> That's fair. For decades, makeup artists relied on monster flicks and the B movie market to showcase their talents. Get away! These low budget horror films became a film genre in their own right and built up an enthusiastic following. But by the early 80s, the time was right for someone who respected the old makeup tricks to give them a new lease of life in a mainstream movie. 
love that whole concept of changing into a monster, and, and, and I love those scenes, you know, those transformation scenes, which up until American Werewolf, they were pretty much achieved by lap dissolves, where you would apply a little makeup on the person and pretty much lock him in position, photograph it, dissolve to the next stage, which was a little bit more makeup. That's why the person had to pretty much stay still. And they never did quite line up, so the eyes would always kind of dissolve up a little higher, a little lower, and move around. Rick Baker won the first ever Makeup Oscar for his revolutionary work on this film. When I met Rick Baker, who did the makeup, of course, he said to me, I feel sorry for you. And I said, you know, I said, well, wait a minute, you don't understand, this is like a, one of those career moves. And he uh, I said, well, just report next week for, you know, for the makeup. And he said, oh, by the way, how much hair do you have on your body? <laughs> First question, I went, this is kind of strange. I didn't have the problem of having lots of chest or back hair, but obviously um, a lot of body hair would make it difficult to put more yak hair, which was what the werewolf cost or st stuff was made of. So, you know, you have your arms waxed. That's it. Really, I recommend it if you've never done it before. Uh, you know, like bodybuilders and swimmers, uh, you know, they start, you start hairless when you're going to become a werewolf and go from there. I burn it off! You know, everything changed and stretched. Everything was duplicated. My arms, my legs, my head, uh, many times in different expressions. Someone I really care for. There is a period uh, uh, during the filming when they take it, my arm out of the equation, put it literally behind and off camera behind my back, uh, and and from and attach from my elbow the replica, which looks exactly like my hand, only it's made of, of you know cable and can stretch. And one of the first things I came up with that I thought would be interesting was to do a hair growing effect. I thought I could make a false head that I could actually punch hairs through the material and film it in reverse where I'd actually pull the hairs in and it would look like the hairs were growing out when it was reversed. part where David Naughton's body's really stretched out. He has a very elongated spine and his limbs are more dog-like. His feet are stretched in these like dog-like things. Uh, the only part that was really David was his head and arms and he was through a hole in the floor and his whole false body blended onto his, his shoulders and, and we had appliances on his hand and on his face. When I fall and turn around and, and I'm on my back watching this body grow, it's a stage and uh, there's room for my body to go underneath the floorboards and for guys to be underneath the floor working the mechanical body, which is actually stretching. At some point when I'd had plenty of hair on the elongated forehead and nose and the mouth had shot forward, now that's a mechanical head. In this head we had uh, mechanics that would push out. Uh, these are actually not the teeth that were used in the in the head, these were actually Jack Nicholson's teeth from Wolf. When these teeth were inside the head, uh, we had a mechanism to push these teeth forward and open them up, so it stretched the rubber along with it and distorted the head. We had little forms in the cheekbones that push the cheekbones out, things that stretch the ears out. So we actually made a head that without, without the use of, of optical effects, that actually on the day you turn the camera on and, and, it, and it did this. I think it was pretty effective for the time. halfway through the week. I just didn't want to go back to that makeup process. And then they'd say, well, you know, um, in The Elephant Man, he wore it every day. Or, you know, there'd always, there'd always be an example in film about someone who had to wear the makeup the whole time. The problem with the kind of makeup I do is sometimes it just takes too long.
King Kong was the giant step that marked the triumphant arrival of visual effects in the movies. Kong wasn't a man in a gorilla suit, nor a full-size monster. Kong was a 13-inch model. Thanks to trick photography and animation, fantasy became fact before our eyes. Dreamed up by Willis O'Brien, King Kong was made at RKO, where Linwood Dunn was head of visual effects. When I was working on King Kong, I had a feeling that it was going to be quite a milestone, a unique type of film. It was looked on as a horror picture, it really was. Much of it, you know, was so extreme that later on certain scenes had to be taken out in order to get by the public. There was much technology pioneered in that picture, and in particular, the miniature projection, which is where a small screen is mounted into a miniature, and the animation goes on in front of it. Fay Ray is in this cave, and uh, that was nothing but a projected picture which had been made so that at a certain frame, her image disappeared. And so the animation went on right up to the point where Kong's hand got in front of the screen as he was picking her up. The next frame, she was out of it, and the little model was put in his hand. To create the scene where Kong climbed the Empire State Building, the building was shot, and that film brought back to the studio and then used to align up with a model. And that model was uh, made pure white so it wouldn't photograph, but the shape was there. And then the little Kong animated figure was set on the side of that model and animated to climb up. So taking the two scenes later and superimposing them was a straightforward job. It had certain other aspects to it that were humorous in a way, and certain almost, you might say, romantic, because they tried to give the idea that it was a certain even romantic interest that uh, uh, Kong had for Fay Ray. I felt that we were into something quite new, innovative, and it was either going to be quite a smashing success or something that might grow in popularity well, over the years. The airplane's got it. Oh, no. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. The film that got me uh, into the film business and uh, changed my life completely was King Kong, made in 1933. I saw it when I was, uh, I think, 13, and uh, I haven't been the same since. It just struck a note in me that made me want to do this type of uh, filmmaking. Ray Harryhausen carried on the visual effect traditions of model making and stop motion photography pioneered in King Kong. He became the greatest illusionist of them all and influenced a generation of fantasy filmmakers. Working from his attic studio in North London, the films he made were inventive and spectacular, but always made on a shoestring. The budgets were always so terribly low that it was almost painful. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, I think the whole film cost $200,000 to make, including the special effects. You can hardly buy a costume today for that.
We had made so many films about the monsters on the loose, which were popular in the 50s. And uh, you just can't keep destroying city after city. We destroyed Rome, we destroyed uh, San Francisco, we destroyed New York. So I started ransacking the Arabian Nights stories and I came across Sinbad and felt that would be one way to introduce a skeleton as a character in the picture without making it seem like a comedy <laughs> and laugh at it. <laughs> The basic of stop frame can be shown right in this little skeleton. Inside of this uh, skeleton is another skeleton made of metal with very tiny ball and socket joints which will hold their position long enough to take a, a still picture. And of course the key problem is to keep it in synchronization so that the skeleton will flow like a, a person would flow. And that comes from experience. We have the advantage with the model animation uh, to um, simply use one model and advance it frame by frame on the same basic principle as a cartoon. And all. In Jason, we had seven skeletons fighting three men. Uh, which took uh, almost four and a half months to do just the animation sequence to combine it all. Every frame of film had to be timed so that during the sword fight, when the actor's uh, sword would stop, the skeleton had to be there at a certain time to stop that sword. We had a stuntman portraying each skeleton during rehearsals. And then in the final piece of film where I was to combine the skeletons with the humans, the actors had a shadow box. So they were v well familiar with the routine by that time. So through counts, they could uh, go through the routine without the stuntmen there. And that was the piece of film I would combine the animation with. They used to say that the camera never lies but I think it's one of the biggest liars in the history of uh, invention. It must have been the wind. You can do such wonderful tricks with the camera. Jason legend, there is a creature called uh, Talos. So we designed the um, character to be like a giant statue of the gods. The actual model of Talos was the same size as this reproduction of, in bronze. Uh, and uh, I had to photograph, of course, the people at a great distance and then uh, photograph the statue close up and then these two films were combined. When we were doing uh, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, we had uh, Kali, an Indian goddess with six arms. In order to do the rehearsals, we had to strap three uh, uh, stuntmen together with a big belt. So one behind the other, each one to show the position for the six arms. We had to synchronize these arms with the actors so that uh, they would know where to place their swords at the key position. 
and uh, it was rather a grotesque sight on the set to see them moving around these three people with all these six arms playing in every direction. This one actor, I remember, he sat down and just started to cry. He, he couldn't remember his counts because they were so complicated. <laughs> From the very beginning, cinema has exploited its capacity for fantasy, particularly through science fiction. Amazingly, a French pioneer, Georges Méliès, had begun to make sci-fi films with models and animation at the turn of the century. For years, his techniques were improved on, though little changed. But sci-fi remains the cinema's Cinderella the stuff of buffs, until one man, Stanley Kubrick, changed the rules. His 2001 A Space Odyssey became the most believable science fiction film ever made. 2001 was originally called Journey Beyond the Stars, and the first draft of the screenplay I saw was dramatically different from how the movie ultimately came out. And it also had this wonderful thing in, in, in the script because it was impossible to describe in any you know, normal dialogue terms what Kubrick was intending, but the script had these big blank pages. And at the top of the page it said, you know, fantastic visual effect sequence of spacecraft areas, Ares headed toward the moon. You know, a team of experts is working on this and trust us it'll be great. And the script was filled with that kind of thing. The techniques we used were very straightforward. Every spacecraft, the discovery, every planet, every star is always moving at a constant speed. And in most of the scenes, when one object is entering the scene, another object is getting out of the way so that they would never overlap. The, the limitations of the technology created kind of a simple elegance to the movie of these constantly moving, sort of almost balletic motions, which later on tended to dictate the kind of music that Kubrick ultimately selected. The stars as spattered white paint on glossy black paper, photographed uh, one frame at a time on an animation stand. Um, whether it was Jupiter or Jupiter's moons or Earth or whatever, that was also shot on the animation stand, but those would be backlit 8x10 color transparencies of paintings that were airbrushed to create the, the light and dark side of the Earth, photographed with uh, what Jeffrey Unsworth called uh, pre-war gauze. He found these wonderful black silk stockings uh, made before the World War that, that turned out to be really great uh, flare filters and gave a lot of beautiful glow without uh, de-sharpening the shots. If you take the Discovery spacecraft, for instance, it was not moving ever. It was just a huge 52-foot long or 54-foot long miniature that was lit from one side or the other with key light and fill light. Uh, and the camera would be rigged on a long metal track uh, uh, and the camera would just move very slowly past the Discovery spacecraft on very slow moving motors with the camera cranking over a very slow frame rate. That was the beginning of electronic motion control. This shot signaled the arrival of computers in visual effects, gliding the camera past a model in a technique that became known as motion control. Two thousand and one's willingness to experiment with new techniques changed the world of visual effects forever. But it was another space epic that took up the challenge and turned visual effects into an all-time money spinner.
1977, this opening shot in Star Wars was a milestone in cinema history. The film gave the kiss of life to the dying visual effects industry, which had been all but wiped out during the collapse of the studio system in the 50s. Director George Lucas turned all that around when he assembled a group of college computer buffs and gave them Star Wars to play with. In 1977, when people went to see Star Wars, they knew they were seeing images that they'd never seen before. They didn't know how it gotten those kind of pictures, because now you saw spaceships racing towards you. You saw things happening very quickly. Something that really hadn't been possible to do prior to that. And the reason was that computers were now being used in motion pictures. When you see a spaceship roaring towards you in a Star Wars movie or any movie, the model probably never moved. The model was immobile in front of a blue screen. It was the camera that came in toward that model. So what we do is we have a motor powering the camera's forward advance on a, on a rail, and frame by frame, the camera is moved little by little toward that spaceship. So that particular technique is what we call motion control. And if you want to add another spaceship to that same shot, you take away the first one, put a new one in position, and you can again program the computer to move again that way. Not just the movement of the camera itself in the forward motion, but the camera can also be tilted this way and this way. Pretty much each spaceship was shot one at a time against the blue background. And then the motions were programmed by the camera operator following a storyboard. Here they come. Watch it, you've got one on your tail. I'm I'll be right there. I don't know if George knew how those effects were going to come out. Very early on, some friends of mine talk to him about the show, and he wanted to do it by just taking models and throwing them past the camera, or sliding them down wires, or whatever would work for the shots. He didn't want to get into a big technology thing, but that wouldn't have ever given him, you know, what he wanted. So uh, I think it ended up being more complex than he wanted it to be, and you know, probably would like it. After Star Wars, George Lucas turned his visual effects team into a company called Industrial Light and Magic, which he then transformed into a bankable film star. But in the battle to stay ahead, the old model shop has been among the casualties. Now, godlike animators and designers use digital effects to create their own universe. It's a universe written by the computer, directly onto film. Our first big venture at ILM in digital effects was not for a Lucasfilm, but for a Star Trek film, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. And in that, there is a scene where the camera flies over, it's supposedly in a spaceship, flies over a planet that metamorphosizes in front of us. It changes from a cold, forbidding place to a beautiful, lush planet with green trees and blue water. Instead of a dead moon, a living, breathing planet capable of sustaining whatever life forms we see fit to deposit on it. Fascinating. It's a beautiful image, and for its day, it was stunning. The fact is that there was no planet. There was no place like this. There was no way we could have filmed that. It was all done in a computer, every bit of it. It was in the brain of a computer. It was not a physical model. The usefulness of this process becomes clear. We showed it to Steven Spielberg, who was so impressed with the picture that he said, I want to make a whole movie that way. And I said, Steven, the nectar comes out a drop at a time. You'll not be able to do a whole film this way. It's very difficult to do it. And of course, he proved me wrong, because now we've got Jurassic Park. Parker. Jurassic Park is full of computer-generated dinosaurs you can believe in. 
The evolution of digital visual effects has taken just 10 years, quicker than anyone would have thought possible. Cut, print, great. Visual effects build on what's gone before. Star Wars veteran and the industry's latest FX genius is Dennis Muren. He was inspired by the films of Ray Harryhausen to get into the business. It looks like the whole body is there merely to prepare. The first time I did anything with computer graphics was for young Sherlock Holmes with a stained glass character that comes out of a window and, and sort of attacks a knight for a sequence that we shot in a church in England. Seven shots took six months, which is a long time. But what you get out on the screen, you know, was something that was pretty much totally unique. And then that led to, that, that was successful and led to more and more evolution. It still took three or four years before things got a little bit faster. Balance of essence, fire begets snow. For Willow, I tried morphing, where you shoot two pieces of film and you can sort of blend the one into the other one. Uh, and if you shoot it right, you won't know you're seeing two pieces of film. You'll see it actually just appear to morph, actually transform from one to another. And the sequence, I think, in Willow probably had five or six changes from one character to another, to another, to another, to another, to another and came out really well. And that was still another step. And then after that, we did some more things and eventually got into to, uh, the abyss, where we made a complete water snake character. But And that was like a breakthrough in itself. Oh, wait, it's OK. The real tough stuff going on that was that was when the face appeared on the end of it. You know, how do we get the, how do we get this? This to, to conform to a topography that you recognize. I mean, we had to have two faces, and they had to look like the actors that were in the film. That was pretty difficult, and we managed to find a place where we could actually scan the actors in and, and get digital data back that we could then sort of essentially morph the front of the water snake character and push from that the data that we had gotten from, from this laser scan. When we saw that, this was like the most amazing thing. And we have always been, I think the entire department and myself have always been surprised at the work we're doing. Is it alive? Seawater. Man. We're getting better and the hardware's getting better and the software's getting better. You know, this is an incredible tool we've got here. And I think for five or ten more years, we're going to still be learning how to harness it and how to really get the most out of it. It was pretty much of an assault on your mind moving. You know, it was very loud and, and you know, it was really a, an incredible show. I had a lot of stuff that we had, had never even done, didn't even know if we could do, with the shape changing character. Hey, Gwen, you want some coffee? No, thanks. One of the sort of easy things about it was it was a chrome character which reflected the environment around it, which is an easy thing for computer graphics to do. The really tough thing about it, of course, is that it had to be a human character that had to move and act like a human, and it had to change from one shape to another, to another, to another, 
And that took a lot of time to figure out how mathematically we could get the geometry to move around without essentially ripping itself apart. Hey, I got a full house. That's good, Lewis. Must be my lucky day. You know, the funny thing on a lot of these shows that I've worked on that is that we don't know how big they're going to be till it's over with. Welcome to Jurassic Park. What do they got in there, King Kong? Stephen came in uh, one day and said, we have to have a really big gate for Jurassic Park. And we drew something, I think it was like 25 feet, and he goes, no, no, bigger. How big is the car there? Bigger, bigger. Um, so he wanted it big, and he wanted it to be a, a, an homage to uh, King Kong. The way that Stephen wanted to do the show was he wanted to do it all with full-size dinosaurs the way that they made a full-size bust of King Kong that he had seen on the Universal Studio Tour in Florida, and it was great. If they can do this, they can give me a full-size Tyrannosaurus Rex walking along the stage that I can direct. That wasn't possible. Um, and as the people at ILM started getting into it, they, on their own, constructed a, a skeleton of a, a T-Rex in the computer and then moved that dinosaur through a, a run cycle. So that gave the, the impetus to give an okay for them to try to make dinosaurs that we would see in the distance, like the, in, the, in the running shots and the herds and that kind of thing. To begin with, Steven Spielberg approved of making most of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park as full-sized models. But then the computer team changed his mind with some persuasive arguments. We came up with the idea of doing a stampede sequence where we could have one animal and then we could do 10 of them for essentially the same cost. You wouldn't have to make all these additional models. And if it was running, then maybe if the skins didn't look right on it, then it would be okay because you're looking at this sort of chaos and everything. So we, we did this, some tests with a running series of Gallimimuses. And these first tests came out phenomenal. So they gave us more money to move ahead. Look at the wheeling, the uniform direction changes, just like a flock of birds evading a predator. They're, uh, they're flocking this way. In the meantime, a, a Tyrannosaurus had been made by Steve Williams here, uh, just a bone structure of it. And so we decided to do a test with the T-Rex. With the and it came out great. At that point, Stephen said, this technology is worth putting some more money into. And as a result of this, there's about 52 shots in the show that are totally computer graphic dinosaurs. We hit upon an arc, almost, of, of technological breakthroughs so that as they got to certain plateaus, they could constantly top themselves and do things far better than they thought they would have maybe six months before. So the, the role of the computerized dinosaur in that movie just grew and grew and grew. Keep absolutely still. This vision's based on movement. You know, I, I don't think it should all be computer graphics. I don't think shows need to be that. I think there's something to be said for the mixture that, that makes things harder to figure out. The T-Rex's head is a model. Turn the light off, turn the light off. Now it's computer generated. Turn the light off! You know, the trick is not trying to, to push one technology to do something it can't do. You know, do this technology to the best, that technology to the best, and make them look like they're the same. But occasionally, computer graphics get upstaged by the real thing. As Anthony Quinn once said, Something's wrong with my eyes. But there wasn't. In this film, something remarkable was going on. When director Richard Fleischer was preparing Barabbas in Italy, he was told a total eclipse of the sun was due. A filmmaker's dream, economy and serendipity combined. I knew there was something wrong when I saw that light. We achieved in one film that I made one of the greatest special effects of all time, and we did it without any special effect. God was our special effects man on the film. They built Calvary on a hill south of Rome, 
and for the whole village, the event became real. We had quite a crowd there of the uh, local people. And everyone fell to their knees and prayed. Something spectacular was happening there. When we ran the film, not knowing whether we were going to get really anything on the film, we had a perfect exposure and a flare. One flare. And the flare was in the shape of a cross and was right above the center cross. I tell you, when we saw that, we, saw, we knew the hand of God was helping us along here. And we have been accused of doctoring that film. And of course, uh, we never touched that piece of film. So there's one of the greatest special effects of all time. And it had nothing to do with computers or anything else. Next week, the series examines the partnership of music and film, Sunday night on Granada at 9 o'clock. If you'd like a booklet based on this series with more information about the world of cinema, please write a cheque for £3 made payable to BSS and send to The Dream Factory, PO Box 7, London W5, 2GQ.